Okay, I see some familiar names on the participant list. So thanks to those of you that have been coming to multiple water talks so far this year and to the folks who are coming for the first time as well. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for Awa's third water talk of 2021. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, everybody will be muted for the duration of the talk. So if you would like to ask questions to our speaker, just type them in the chat function in Zoom and I will ask them at the end of the presentation. Um, the session is being recorded, so you're welcome to keep your cameras on or off, but just be mindful uh, if you leave them on, not to do anything that you wouldn't want to be on the internet forever. Um, always good to remind people of that. And um, let's see, with that, I'll uh, get into the introduction. So just for those of you that may not be aware, uh, my name is John Balanoff. I'm the executive director of the Acting Lake the Watersheds Alliance. Uh, AWA is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting and restoring water quality in the lakes, rivers, and streams of Wakefield, New Hampshire, and Acton, Maine. Uh, we run a variety of water quality programs that incorporate local, state, and federal partners, and our Water Talk series uh, is just one of these. So our main goal with Water Talks is to try to bring information that's both engaging and relevant to our community. Typically, we host these in the springtime to start to get people starting to think about water quality and lake ecology as we head into the summer season. Uh, so with that, I'll introduce our speaker for tonight. We have Josh McGacy, who is a wildlife biologist with New Hampshire Fish and Game, uh, with the Non-Game and Endangered Wildlife Program of New Hampshire Fish and Game. He is a program's turtle specialist with extensive experience monitoring and managing populations of Blandings, Spotted, Wood, and Eastern Box Turtle populations. Josh helps manage the Reptile and Amphibian Reporting Program, RAARP monitors other reptile and amphibian populations and works on environmental review projects when they involve potential impacts to state listed turtle populations. Also participates in regional reptile and amphibian working groups with other federal, state, and NGO biologists to conserve turtle populations at a wide range scale. So tonight, Josh is gonna be discussing the biology and ecology of common reptiles and amphibians we see in New Hampshire's lakes, wetlands, rivers, and streams. And uh, with that, I will pass it off to you, Josh. So you are welcome to start sharing your screen. Okay. Go get rid of mine and uh, feel free to take it away. Hopefully that wasn't too dense of an intro and I hopefully I did pronounce your last name right. I apologize if I did it's not. It's okay, it's it's Megacy, but you're close. I should have asked, my apologies. <laughs> That's okay. All right, one minute here. Okay, everybody see that okay? We can see it, yep. Looks good, okay. All right. Okay, well, well, thanks for the introduction. I appreciate you having me. Um, I, um, you know, this is, this is a great opportunity in a, in a part of the state um, that I, I haven't done a lot of I haven't done a lot of work. I haven't done a lot of field monitoring, but um, but I spent a great deal of my youth in the Ossipee Wakefield area and, and um, sort of cut my teeth there on a lot of um, some of the rare, um, more rare uh, reptiles and amphibians in New Hampshire. And um, sort that's sort of like the part of the state where things things set in motion for me and and I knew what I wanted to do when I when I grew up and um so it's a real honor to be here in in New Hampshire working with the species that I I grew up wanting to learn about and wanting to protect and um so it's special for me to be presenting to all of you in in a very special part of the state for me so thank you um so John gave you an introduction. I will say um right off the bat that I, I do have most of my experience is is with most of my real intensive experiences with with uh, rare and endangered turtles in New Hampshire. So I'll spend a little bit more time talking about them, <clears throat> but I do have um, a lot of experience with um, with some of the snake species and and amphibians as well. And um, I'm not going to touch on every single um, reptile and amphibian in the state. I'm going to hit all the ones that um, are either interesting or um, you, you typically find in in this part of the state. Um, so, um, just a little background on the non-game program. Um, so 
because we're non-game, we are um, we're uh, charged with protecting. Um, it's 30 endangered species, 21 threatened species, and 62 species of special uh, special concern species, um, and then thousands of other unlisted species from insects, mussels, mammals, birds, bats. Um, so um, we have a lot of responsibility, and um, we rely on. Um, mostly federal funding to do a lot of that work. But that list there of endangered wildlife in New Hampshire, you can find right on our website. And I'll give you some more of that later. So um, uh, New Hampshire has um, 40 different species of um, reptiles and amphibians, 18 reptiles. So seven turtles, 11 snakes, um, and 22 amphibians. Um, and I'm gonna try to get through uh, as many of them as I can. Um, so a lot of them are, are large. Um, this is a big 40 pound snapping turtle that we pulled out of a, a wetland in the southern part of the state. Um, and uh, it's really exciting to see. And uh, it's really exciting to see an animal that large um, just below your feet. And then some are very, very small. That's a baby or hatchling uh, musk turtle, which are also common in lakes and ponds in New Hampshire. Um, so before I get into this individual species, uh, I, I get asked once in a while, so what, what, why do we care about reptiles and amphibians? What's so important about them? What does it matter if we lose any of them? And so they are important uh, contributors to local food webs and, and um, a lot of them are uh, predators of um, what we consider pests. So larval mosquitoes and other flying insects as well as leeches. They're also very good indicator species of um, the environment and its health. And so sensitive, they're sensitive to climate change, development pressure, and even pollution, so water quality. So when we see declines in reptiles and amphibians, it tells us something about the environment and the habitat that they're living in. Um, and then protecting biodiversity is just, you know, it can, it can benefit human health in a lot of different ways. We're seeing right now, um, well, we're hopefully at the tail end of a, of a pandemic where um, these uh, viruses, zoonoses are coming out of wild populations and, and into human populations because we're pushing the, we're pushing the fray. We're, we're limiting, we're squeezing their habitat and we're introducing ourselves to their habitats and we're actually bringing them into live markets and things like that. So there's, there's much more uh, direct contact with a lot of these animals and the parasites that they may be hosts of. And so uh, biodiversity is a buffer that really does protect us. So um, we see it with Lyme disease where when um, there's a lot of development in a particular area, the one animal that really seems to do well is white-footed mouse. And white-footed mouse, as we know, is the host for uh, Lyme disease. And um, so the more species you have on the, the landscape, the less white-footed mice you have. And so a lot of that ties into the configuration of the landscape, but, um, but, but it, it all ties into biodiversity. And reptiles and amphibians uh, populations have been declining um, globally. And that's, that continues for a variety of reasons um, that I'll talk about now. Um, so road mortality is a big one. I'm sure everybody's seen squash snakes and turtles on roads, especially where they uh, bisect wetlands or go near streams or uh, lakes or ponds. Um, we put up turtle crossing signs in areas, has some, some effectiveness, but, um, but on a high speed road, um, you know, that they're just, uh, most people can't even see them unless it's a really large snapping turtle. But um, these animals are very mobile. Some of them move between habitats often. I'll talk more about that too, but um, you know, they don't just sit in one pond all year. Some of them hibernate in one pond and then they move to a different wetland type and, and then they go to the uplands for nesting. And the same thing with snakes. They have large home ranges and they don't consider roads. Um, so they, they cross them to get to a different habitat type, depending on the season. 
uh, residential and commercial development is just habitat loss. And so um, there's, there's good and bad development um, in cities like this one, uh, this is bad. So that's a, a wetland, sort of a stream feature there that's just completely surrounded by development. Um, it's a genetic island. There's just the turtles that are there and there are turtles there. This is Nashua. Um, there's no genetic exchange. So the genetic diversity starts to decline. Population starts to decline. Water quality starts to decline. And um, obviously there's a lot of road mortality associated with a site like this. But they're still there. They hang on for long periods of time. But um, but they're what we call the the Walking Dead. It's it's a sad story, but it's it's the reality. Um, so the other thing with um, turtles in particular, but also snakes and even some salamanders, is um, uh, commercial collection. And so um, there is a market, a black market for turtles in particular in in Asia. Um, some New Hampshire turtles can get pretty high prices, four or five hundred dollars a turtle, um, and it's it's very attractive to um, to people who are in that trade because the penalties for trading in wildlife is um, is a lot less than if you were dealing in um, contraband like uh, weapons or or drugs or narcotics or something like that. So there's that appeal. There's, you know, we've had, we've seen offenders who have been convicted multiple times and they just keep doing it because they get the slap on the wrist, but they're still making a lot of money um, and they're able to get out of jail. So um, a lot of the turtle populations and our rare snake populations were very sensitive about sharing information about them because that information in the wrong hands can point a collector right to a site where um, they could in some places wipe out an entire population and they can be very effective at doing that. Um, so this is happening. We don't have a lot of evidence of it in New Hampshire, but it's something um, that we watch carefully. And um, and so one of the regional working groups I, I'm involved in is, is trying to get law enforcement and um, state police, town police, um, and other biologists to be all aware of this and kind of have a um, a plan to address this within the United States. There are laws that, um, you know, pr protect the turtles from export and things like that, but they have to be caught. And so we're trying to raise awareness. Um, so anyway, and um, these are just a bunch of articles that have come out. There was just another one. Oh, I don't know, uh, a couple days ago, maybe a week ago, where somebody was caught with a suitcase full of hatchling Galapagos tortoises. So they actually got their hands on Galapagos tortoises and made it out of the island. Um, luckily they were caught, but I mean, that's pretty bold because uh, there's a lot of eyes there. Um, predators are a threat, not too bad in New Hampshire, but um, in areas where there's a lot of, there's dense development, we have subsidized predators like raccoons. So the more, you know, uh, trash cans there are around, the more raccoons there are going to be, or the more cornfields there are, the more raccoons and skunks. And they're very effective at um, digging up turtle nests, uh, snake nests, eating reptiles and amphibians. Um, and so sort of a threat, Not, nothing that we're too worried about right now, but, um, but it's something that we continue to monitor. Recreation and trails can be an issue. I, I mentioned how uh, you know, collection of turtles is a problem for black markets, but even just casual collection. So somebody picking up a rare turtle, like a wood turtle and bringing it home as a pet. Um, that turtle has now been removed from its population. If it's a female, it can no longer contribute to the population. It can't, it can't reproduce. And so, um, and in a lot of times that turtle cannot be returned even if, it, if they wanted to, because Sometimes people put it in tanks with fish and things like that, and there are diseases that can go back and forth. And then that turtle could potentially introduce a disease into that environment um, without anybody even knowing it. So, um, so casual, even casual collection is something that's um, you know, it's a uh, it's a big deal, and it's and it's a hard thing to talk about because I you know, growing up, I mean, I spent a lot of time catching turtles and frogs and snakes and putting them in tanks and I would return them, but um, 
it's very hard because I mean that's where people get their interest and their love of of nature and wildlife and um, but education is important and trying to get the message out there that you know wherever you find that animal just keep it where it is um, and so but but keeping trails um, especially if they're high use trails so if they're or multi use trails so if they're you know uh, ATVs mountain bikes and and hiking and stuff like that. Um, those are those are the worst, and and they they should be designed in a way that they they don't go around wetlands, they don't go through turtle nesting areas, and um, um, you know, basically keeping them out of sensitive areas. And so we have a um, trails development tool on our website as well, where you can actually put in your trail route, and it'll tell you where the sensitive areas are. It's a GIS model, um, but it uh, it's pretty effective. So it'll show in red like. You know, you probably don't want to put your trail here because it goes right in between a vernal pool and a wetland, um, and then it could be uh, degrading over time. So, so now I'm just going to go through um, the species we have in New Hampshire. I'm going to start with uh, sort of like the habitats and work through those species. Um, I like to start with vernal pools, especially this time of year, because this is when they're, as you know, they're they're alive. Um, and they're, um, they, you know, it's, we're still trying to gather information on vernal pools in the state because um, for a long time, these were just considered puddle, puddles in the woods or low wet depressions in the woods and a lot of them would be filled, but they're extremely important um, and productive wetland types and they are protected in the state as a wetland feature, um, but they need to be identified. So the wood frog is like the, the, uh, the perfect vernal pool indicator species. It's probably one of the first ones, well, them and spring peepers that you hear um, as soon as the ice starts to come off of that vernal pool and you hear they're, they're quacking. Um, do I, yeah, hopefully this isn't too loud. Can you hear that? Yeah. So you hear they're, they're quacking and, uh, sorry, you hear that quacking and um, that's when the vernal pools are starting to come alive. That's when the wood frogs have basically thawed out and started breeding. Um, they overwinter just under leaf litter in the woods and in, in shallow soils, and they will actually freeze solid um, because they have an antifreeze um, solution in their blood that protects their cells. And so they can actually freeze solid and they come back to life in the spring and start breeding. And so there's the, the frog eggs there. And you can see, um, I'm going to show you the spotted sal salamander eggs in a minute, um, but they are a little bit different and I'll, and I'll explain how to tell the difference. But I also wanted to point out in the, the top left corner, the, uh, the, um, the spe our species distribution maps. I'm going to show this for all the species. And um, this is something that's uh, it's always going to be a work in progress because most of the information that's on that map, as far as occurrence data, comes from people submitting records to us. And so if you send us a record of a wood frog up in, uh, you know, Cold Brook, um, it doesn't mean that there's no wood frogs there because it's not on the map. It's it's because nobody's reported it or we haven't gone up there and and um, and reported it ourselves. And so it's really important to get that information to us because we know wood frogs, for example, that they're, they're probably covering the whole state. So um, even in high elevations. Um, so. Um, and I'll talk more about how to do that later. So um, uh, spotted salamanders are also vernal pool indicator species. Um, this time of year, they're in the, they spend their time in the overwintering in the woods, in the ground. They're called a mole salamander because they spend all their time digging through the soil and feeding down there. And in uh, the first warm rainy nights of the spring is what we call big nights and they come out in droves and you'll see them all over roads and in the woods and they make their way into vernal pools where they're, they start breeding. And sometimes on the right night, you can go and see 40, 50 spotted salamanders breeding and you can see spermatophores and you can see them making eggs. There's their egg mass right there. Um, so their eggs are a little bit different. They have a, a big thick coating of gel around them, which is a little bit different than the wood frog eggs where you can see each one is more like a little tiny capsule. So there's these little, little globby eggs um, versus the big, the big solid um, gel there. 
Uh, and they're also likely um, statewide. When you see that they've been reported all the way up to Pittsburgh, um, you know that they can, they can handle pretty much any temperature in uh, the state. And they come out early sometimes. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a photograph just like this one in February where it warmed up just enough, 45, 50 degrees, plenty of snow on the ground and they come out looking to breed. Um, they can tolerate cold. They can't freeze like a wood frog can, but they can tolerate cold temperatures. And um, so this is not uncommon, but if you ever see that, get a picture of it and send it to me because the more the better. And uh, it's also good information to have uh, to track how early these animals are starting to come out every year. So, um, you know, when we start to see a lot of these, uh, we see more of this happening in February. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Hopefully not going to continue, but um, we'll see. Marble salamanders are um, a really um, rare salamander in New Hampshire. And you can see on the map there, they're really restricted to the southern part of the state, southern towns. We only have two populations that we have known and documented. Um, and as you go south, they get more abundant. Um, but they're... Um, in, in that part of the state, they're also a vernal pool indicator species and they actually lay their eggs in the fall. Um, so they're different. They lay their eggs in the fall on the, um, on, the, on the forest floor next to a vernal pool. And then as soon as they get a, um, a fall rain, the vernal pool fills up a little bit and the eggs hatch. And then the larva spend the whole winter in a frozen vernal pool. And then they uh, metamorphose in the, in the spring and turn into the juvenile terrestrial form um, and then complete the cycle. Um, but we're always looking for more information on these, but again, really restricted to the Southern part of the state. All right, now we'll move on to um, permanent wetlands and ponds. Um, I'll talk about these guys in a minute. Um, so uh, this is gonna cover anything from Great East Lake to you know, the shrub swamp or this beaver impounded um, or this beaver swamp right here. Um, this is a typical shrub swamp um, uh, with blueberry and uh, tussocks and different, different uh, aquatic species and woody stems. Um, so spring peepers will be vernal pools, but also more permanent water bodies. Um, they can freeze a little bit, but not like the wood frogs can. I'm not going to play their sound. Uh, I'm sure you know what their sound is. It's deafening right now if you open your open your door once it gets dark. Um, but um, but they're it's my favorite part of the year when I start to hear them. Um, so uh, red spotted newt is the New Hampshire state amphibian, and these ones are interesting because the adults are the on the left. The uh, they they're aquatic, so they develop gills. And they um, they spend their time in ponds and wetlands, swimming around, breeding, foraging, um, and then they lay their eggs. And the the larvae are born or hatch in the um, in the in the water. But then the juveniles come out and they turn bright orange. And in the right time of the the year, um, you'll just see those efts. They're called just everywhere. I mean, they they in some places you can just see a huge abundance of them. And they're also likely statewide species. Um, and, um, but yeah, it's, it, it's hard to tell sometimes what you're looking at because when an animal goes from that greenish yellow color to a, to a bright, bright orange, they look like two different um, species completely. Uh, everybody knows a bullfrog and a green frog. I think a lot of people don't know the difference or how to tell the difference between the two. Um, these are also um, distributed statewide, um, most common frogs. But the, um, so real quick, the, the bullfrog on the top has no dorsolateral ridge. And I hope you can see my mouse, but this line right here is the dorsolateral ridge. And only the green frog has that. Um, the bullfrog, it's completely absent. Um, bullfrogs will also have, um, the males will have big yellow throats, but, uh, sometimes the green frogs, the males will have a little bit of that too, but the dorsolateral ridge is key. 
um, to identifying the two. And those green frogs can get pretty big. So um, you can't always, you can't always judge by the size, but um, bullfrogs are the ones that have that deep, deep croak um, that you hear like that. And they, um, they're also pretty ravenous predators. Um, they've been documented eating uh, hatchling turtles. Uh, they'll eat salamanders, small mammals. Um, so they're pretty, pretty aggressive feeders. Um, pickerel frogs are also um, pretty common around ponds, wetlands. In the summer, they're all over the fields and in the forest. Um, they're often confused with uh, northern leopard frogs. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, later because they're associated with a different habitat type. But the, the key with them is that they're, they're always this brownish color with sort of a light cream or pink. And then they got this yellow in the legs. Um, and the spots are usually square or bar shaped and the leopard frogs are, are usually round, but I'll show a side by side later. Um, and sorry, these photos aren't great, but uh, everybody's seen an American toad. And um, if you, uh, this time of year, they're, they're breeding pretty, uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, and they breed in wetlands. So they'll be all over the wetlands and ponds breeding and they lay long stra strand like eggs. Um, pretty easy to identify. Um, also a statewide species. And then the tree frog is one that's not often seen. And when people do see them, they're sometimes confused with American toads or spring peepers, but they look a little exotic sometimes. They, um, sometimes they're, they can change color from a bright, bright green to a gray, to a brown. Um, they're a really beautiful frog, but the best way to tell if you got um, tree frogs around, which you most likely do, is to hear that sound. That trill sound, it's usually the last frog to start calling. So we usually hear peepers, wood frogs, and then you'll start to hear, um, well, then you'll start to hear pickerel frogs, green frogs, um, and then you'll start to hear the tree frogs and bullfrogs. Um, they all have their time of year. Um, uh, painted turtles, it's also the, the state reptile because they're the most common. They can, um, they can tolerate pretty much any type of wetland in the state. So they'll be in streams and rivers, ponds, wetlands. They'll even show up in vernal pools and feed alongside uh, the vernal pool specialists like spotted turtles and Blanding's turtles. They're very abundant. They have the ability to tolerate very anoxic or low oxygen um, uh, wetlands. And so they can hibernate almost anywhere. So all turtles, by the way, they hibernate underwater. And so um, some of them have adapted ways of um, dealing with low oxygen levels in their blood, which makes their blood very acidic. And they buffer that with um, different compounds that are actually in their shell. Um, and painted turtles can just, they can do it very well. And they, and, um, they're usually one of the first ones to pop out too in the spring. Um, and they, they, you just see them basking all over the place, trying to warm up, get oxygen and start, um, because they're cold blooded, they need to get, um, warmed up enough to get, um, to start metabolizing, get hungry and start feeding. Um, so that's why this time of year, there's turtles just lining those logs. And then it starts to decline a little bit as it gets into the warmer months. Oh, uh, one other thing about painted turtles, because these kind of things are fun. Uh, all turtles, they, they, um, all turtles in New Hampshire anyway, they, um, they nest in uh, usually around June, May, June, something like that. They lay their eggs in sandy soil usually, and um, they usually incubate for about 60 to 80 days, and then they hatch. Every turtle species in New Hampshire hatches after 60, 80, 80 days, and they come out of the sand, and they make a beeline for the wetland or the river or whatever it is. Painted turtles, um, the hatchlings hatch underground and they stay there all winter. So they overwinter under the ground um, and they have very, uh, um, there's different strategies for how they do that, but they also have sort of like an antifreeze in their blood um, and they have very flexible shell and um, so they can tolerate it if the ground freezes a little bit. Um, and then so, they start popping out in um, the spring. So around now and or the next over the next month, um, people will start to see these things 
popping out of the ground. Um, and, but they have, they hatched in the, in the fall or summer. Uh, musk turtles are um, fairly common, but not, no, not always seen because they don't come out of the water much. So they, they like mucky bottom ponds and rivers and um, they don't go far to lay their eggs once they get up on land. And then they just, they just get back down into the mud. And um, so musk turtle is referring to a gland they have that um, under the, the shell that it creates a really bad odor when you pick them up. Um, so they got the name stink pot and a lot of places they, that's what they call them, the stink pots. Um, but definitely an underreported species. So if you do see one, um, we'd love to get the records because um, I feel like they're probably not statewide, but they're probably much more widely distributed than that map would indicate. Um, and the key to identifying them is they have that yellow stripe on their face and sort of a domed shell. Um, but they're kind of, they're not the most attractive turtle. Um, and uh, so nothing striking about them like some of our other rare, rare turtles. But anyway, and then um, uh, one of my favorites, the snapping turtles. So this time of year, they're usually, you'll see them coming out and crossing roads because they're coming from where they're hibernating and going to their like foraging wetlands. Uh, I just moved a big one three days ago. Um, actually, it's the same one I've moved for the past three years. He comes out almost at the same time. I shouldn't say he, it's a she, a big female. And um, I help her cross, but she's about 45 pounds. She's a big monster and she's just beautiful um these ones are also so I, I last year i got a report it doesn't reflect on this map but last year i got a report of a snapping turtle all the way up in pittsburgh so they're probably um likely statewide distributed and um they probably trickle off the farther north you get but they are um probably everywhere so you know we need we need all the records so don't don't be shy about reporting um Anyway, you, I think you all know about snapping turtles. Don't go near their head. If you need to move them across the road, grab their back legs. Don't grab them by the tail. Um, that's how people used to do it, but you can separate their vertebra and it can actually do damage to them. Um, grab their back legs or their back shell and you can pick them up and move them across the road. Some people will put them on a carpet or something and drag them across, but don't get bit, it hurts. Um, so spotted turtles are state threatened species. I've spent a lot of time um, monitoring these uh, turtles in the Southern part of the state. And so they likely go up as far as, well, they do go up as far as like the Ospe area. The records are uh, limited up there and I haven't had a lot of success with trapping and finding them. Um, but, I, but it doesn't mean I'm gonna give up. It just means that they're probably um it's probably the like peripheral um part of their range and so um if you see one uh definitely report it they're uh unique because they need they need vernal pools to survive um they need very dense shrubby wetlands and fens um they can't make it in an open water pond or lake um they just can't handle it and um so but they need the they need that combination and so they move from from a shrubby wetland to a fen to a vernal pool and back and forth and um that's why protecting the landscape and habitat protection is so important for for an animal like this because um they're using a much larger area than anybody really knew um and so, and some of those features uh, can be farther away than, um, than they would normally like to travel, but they don't have a choice. And sometimes that's because of either development pressure or, or roads or something like that. Um, so our wildlife action plan identified the top threats, which um, we've also confirmed through, through monitoring, but um, so development and then mortality on roadways and then filling wetlands for development i mean once the habitat's gone it's gone and they're not coming back um that they they can't um they can't just move to a different um type of habitat and so out of all the turtles this is the one i've spent the most of the time most of my time working with um this is the state endangered blandings turtle um and 
Um, so these ones are fairly easy to identify because they have a big dark dome shell. They're typically a fairly large um, turtle and they have a big yellow chin. Um, you, can, you just can't miss that, the yellow under the chin. Sometimes the shell is a little speckled. And um, again, sort of the similar to the spotted turtle where the range is the Southern half of the state. Um, they probably go a little farther west and north than that map, but we're gonna continue to work on that and fill those gaps. <clears throat> um, and so I've spent, I, I've spent probably 10 years working on Blanding's turtle populations and doing habitat management and um, monitoring. Um, they, they use even larger landscapes, intact landscapes. And um, so they go from a pond to a shrub swamp, to a vernal pool, back and forth. And I'm gonna show you something here in a minute that sort of gives you an idea of what's a common, common movement. So this was a female and I, I put a radio transmitter on her uh, um, along with 10 others here. And she, um, we captured her up here and this, this here is a vernal pool. And so some of them will actually, I know it's a vernal pool, but some of them hold water all year. And um, this one does, and she actually overwinters in there. So, um, which is nice because she wakes up in the spring and there's tons of frog eggs and she can eat. And, um, but then she starts moving across the landscape and she bounces to different wetlands. And so by the time we got back out to her, she had, wait a minute, am I missing? Yeah, so by the time we got out there, she had made it over to here, which is another vernal pool. And then she bounced around this wetland, came down here, bounced over to here, across this trail, down here. And then um, from April to June, she made it one mile to this base, basically it's somebody's backyard. It's sort of agricultural, but um, it's somebody's backyard where she laid her eggs and then, and then she booked it right back. And then she went back here. And by October, she had settled right back into here to hibernation. Um, and that is not uncommon. This, this, is, this is how they operate. And you can see that that's a pretty large area. And if this is bisected with roads or developments, luckily this whole area is protected um, other than this road here, but it's fairly low traffic road. Um, you know, they, if development starts to encroach in some of these areas, then we start to see population declines fairly quickly. Um, so really interesting movements. Um, it's really interesting to come up and just find a turtle in the middle of the woods, just trucking it, you know, like without water in sight. Uh, and they're just, just doing it fine. And they eat on their way. <clears throat> they forage the forest. Um, and here's a fernal pool that's um, frozen, but that, that's where she was actually hibernating under the, under the ice. Um, and so all the work that we put into Blanding's turtles over the years, um, <clears throat> we did this a, as a regional effort. So we had a lot of federal funds are called, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, competitive, competitive state wildlife grants. And so we had two of them, um, they're three-year grants. We spent uh, the first three years identifying populations. So we'd go out and live trap in areas that looked suitable and we would identify populations and priority populations. And then we'd, we would rank them. And, um, and then, so uh, we did that for, yeah, for three years straight. And then five years later, we did it again. We went back and we, we resampled the populations. But in that time in between, we had figured out you know, what, the, what the big threats were and what was going on with those particular landscapes that we identified those populations in. Um, and so, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about habitat management later, but, um, but we've developed these best management practices out of it where we, we figured out what their active season was, their nesting season, um, and then their incubation and um, other staging times. Um, and, and these uh, best management practices are, are we provide to like foresters, to conservation commissions, towns, federal partners, uh, landowners, um, and a lot of it goes to um, other agencies who want to do habitat management. And we, we have different partners who we work with, like NRCS and, um, and uh, some of the land trusts who, who do a lot of habitat management. Um, so uh, 
and uh, I don't want to leave out water snakes. Northern water snakes are just um, pretty much everywhere except for the Connecticut River Valley. They're sort of absent over there. But but anyway, these uh, snakes are um, are pretty much in every lake, pond, and river uh, in the state, and um, they're often reported to us as rattlesnakes or water moccasins. Um, and it, a big part of that is because they're a big snake. Um, sometimes they can be curious, so they come up to people in the water. Um, they have different colorations. This one on the bottom left here was one that had just come out of hibernation and it's completely, uh, it's like stained with iron. It must have been in a dirt hole that had a lot of iron in there and it just stained it or, or maybe tannins. But anyway, there's a wide variety of coloration, shape, size, um, but really a uh, beautiful snake. And so there's a water moccasin, but again, we don't have those here. And um, you'll hear people yelling water moccasin in lakes and ponds in New Hampshire a lot, um, but we definitely don't have any. So, <clears throat> um, so uh, ribbon snakes are um, also always associated with water. They're an upland snake. They do spend a lot of time swimming, but they, they're usually in the uplands, but they're, they're right around the edge of streams and ponds. Um, and they're a really beautiful snake, often confused with garter snakes. They're a little bit more slender. They have that chestnut band going down the side. Um, it's uh, pretty diagnostic. Um, their head's a little bit different, um, but a really beautiful snake. Um, and they're also probably statewide. We just don't get a lot of reports of them. So if you can properly identify one or not, just send us a picture, we can identify it. Um, it'd be great to have that information. So now I'm going to move to streams and rivers. Um, so, um, so the northern two-line salamander, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it's, a, it's an interesting uh, adaptation to just, just streams and sometimes very small streams, but large streams too. And they're active like all winter. So I can actually go out in the winter and, and you can flip rocks in the streams and you can find them moving around. Um, and they're, they can tolerate a lot of different temperatures. So they're, they're statewide as well. And the other one is the, uh, so a wood turtle is another turtle I spent a lot of time working with. Um, they're um, dependent on streams uh, exclusively. So that's where they, that's their water type. And so, and they have to be um, oxygen rich streams and usually with a sandy or cobbly um, substrate at the bottom. Um, and so they can't tolerate low oxygen levels in the winter. So when they're underwater, they need a lot of oxygen, like kind of like a brook trout. So they're in similar habitats, um, but they can take oxygen through um, specialized tissues in their mouth. Um, and that helps get them through the winter. Um, and so um, I'm gonna actually, yeah. So uh, we had a similar grant where we, we went out and we surveyed the entire state for three years. And um, these turtles are statewide. They, they can't tolerate the, the fast moving streams in the White Mountains, but otherwise they're everywhere else um, in, in the right habitat. So it's gotta be fairly slow moving streams, sandy, cobbly, and clear, uh, good, good water quality. <clears throat> um, but they're, they come out and they, they um, they hibernate communally sometimes. And this time of year in the spring, where there's a large population, they all come out to bask on um, riverbanks. And collectors have figured that out over the years. And um, so you can go out at the right time of the year. And there are places in New Hampshire where you could spend an hour and collect 40 to 50 wood turtles. And, um, that, and that can be a total population collapse um, when, when something like that happens. Um, so we don't disclose the, inf we don't disclose too much about where these populations are. Um, it's a little bit tricky when we're doing habitat management with partners and things like that, but, um, but there's a reason for it. Um, because they're in streams, they're also very susceptible to, um, getting tangled up in agricultural equipment. Um, hay fields are, and a lot of agriculture is, is usually along streams and rivers where there's rich soils. So they come out and they spend the, from basically May until September in the uplands. So the floodplain and then the forest, and they don't go back to the rivers much at all. 
and so they you know they they spent time in, in hay fields foraging and then sometimes nesting um, and we see that a lot where they either get hit by a tractor or clipped with a blade or or some other equipment um, so it's that's one we're working with the USDA on trying to figure out a way to um, incentivize landowners to change the way they do some of their practices to benefit um, wood turtles where, where we know there's good populations. So there is the uh, northern leopard frog that I said I was going to talk about and I'll bring in the um, the uh, pickerel frog but um, so these ones are a little bit more green typically, so you won't see them as that bronze and brown like the, like the leopard frog, I mean the, uh, the pickerel frog. Um, but they're always, they, they're just really associated with streams and rivers and sometimes big rivers and streams. So along the Connecticut River, the uh, Pemigewasset and Merrimack, and then some of the larger rivers in between, um, they really like to breed in oxbows and some of the temporary wet, wetlands around rivers. And then they spend a lot of time in uh, riparian and um, uh, floodplain uplands. Um, so there's the leopard frog, I mean the uh, pickerel frog picture. And you can see the spots are just different. These leopard frogs have round spots, um, more green in between, and, um, and then the call is different too, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. Um, but they don't have these bars up and down, like the lateral bars. Okay, so hardwood forest, um, I'm gonna just say this is hardwood forest slash mixed forests because some of the species will cover uh, both types. Um, this is where you'll find redback salamanders, which are the most abundant salamander in the Northeast. Um, pretty much under any dead wood on the ground, you can lift it up and find redback salamanders. Um, you'll also find garter snakes. Garter snakes are kind of like the uh, gray squirrel of the reptile world. They're pretty much everywhere. So they're gonna be in your backyard and garage and they'll be in fields and forests and lakes and ponds. So they're just everywhere. But we got data gaps here. So report them because um, we, need the, we need to fill the map. Uh, timber rattlesnake, I'm not gonna talk a lot about them. Um, we only have one, it, only because it makes me sad, <laughs> to be honest, um, that we only have one remaining population in the state that we know of, um, and we've looked a lot, and um, they are critically endangered because they because of human persecution. So they were actively hunted and killed, dens were blown up with dynamite, and they were extirpated from Maine, almost extirpated from New Hampshire, and Vermont, um, but we have one population that's hanging on. We monitor them really, really closely. It's not in the Wakefield area. They used to be in the Ossipee Ring Dyke, but uh, there's no, not much evidence that there's any left there, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, I could take questions on them later, but um, but yeah, it's a it's a sad story. And then they have a, a fungal disease that's um, hit them pretty hard in New Hampshire and other Northeastern states. And a lot of that's because they have such low genetic diversity now. When you only have one population, they're, they're losing alleles quickly. Okay, so um, grasslands and old fields. Um, this is also going to include power line right of ways because they're, um, they're a unique habitat type and uh, there's not a lot of it in the state. And so, um, Power lines might not be the most attractive uh, landscape when you see these big towers, but, um, but the habitat below it is really important for a bunch of different species. Um, the Northern Black Racer, I swear it hangs on in the state because of power lines. Um, it needs uh, early successional forests. It needs uh, shrublands. It uses the forest, but it also needs sandy soils or disturbed soils to lay eggs in. And so state threatened species, um, we, we do monitor them pretty closely, but these are gonna show up um, also hopefully still in the, in the um, uh, this map doesn't show it, but um, a couple of years ago, I did catch a couple in Ossipee. Um, so they're still there and probably Wakefield. I, I used to catch them when I was a kid in Wakefield. So I'm hoping that they're still there, but I don't know what the habitat's like anymore. So, um, you know, if, if they're anywhere, they're gonna be in a shrubby area or power line. Um, so Eastern hognose snakes are another one, kind of like the, uh, the 
the marbled salamander where they're really just now down to the southern uh, border of the state. Um, they're a really interesting, dramatic snake. Um, they spend most of their time in forests um, and in field edges and things like that. They're, they're state endangered, but they come in all kinds of different colors. Um, they have some really interesting um, behavior. They're just one of my favorite snakes. They will play dead. They're the only snake in New Hampshire that will flip over, play dead. Its tongue hangs out of its mouth and it lays there limp. And then other times it'll flare up its neck. Uh, this one's kind of doing it right here. Uh, flares up its neck like a cobra, will lift its head up and, and start hissing. It does this, this hissing, puffing. And, um, and they'll go back and forth between the two. So it's really dramatic and um, really interesting snake, but they're not, um, they're very hard to monitor. They're very hard to get our hands on. We've been tracking them in the Southern part of the state, but, um, but few and far between. Um, so we're gonna keep an eye on them. Eastern box turtle is also uh, now anyway, it's Southern part of the state. This is a turtle that was collected a lot and people have them as pets and they get released into the wild. But we've, through radio telemetry now, we've been able to identify some populations in the southern part of the state and we monitor them closely. We've, we've, we have three populations that we know of. Um, and this is, a, this is a program that we started, oh, I don't know, five years ago, where we, we only had that one female here. And we followed her around for like four years and didn't find anything. And then all, all of a sudden, we started finding more in that same habitat. And then we found more in a, in a few different areas. And so... We're just really trying to piece that together, um, but uh, it's really interesting. And they're a really beautiful turtle. You can see why people want to collect them, um, um, but it's, it's hard to get your hands on them in New Hampshire because they're so rare. Um, but big, big issue with um, forestry because they spend a lot of time in the woods. So the timing of forestry is kind of critical. Um, they like field forest edges. So same thing with wood turtles. They're they can get whacked by agricultural equipment. Um, ATVs uh, in certain areas can be bad because people can run them over and not even know it. And then roadway, roadways. Uh, now I'll go through some snakes sort of quickly. I, I don't know, how am I doing on time, John? Oh, there you go. About eight minutes until 7.30. I wanted to let you, you know, if you have more to do, if you wanna, Maybe wrap up the talk by 7:30 ish, and then we can maybe take a little bit, a couple minutes for questions if folks want to stick around. Sure. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I'll go through these snakes kind of quick. Um, these are all fairly common. They're just not that. They're just not seen that that much. So brown snakes are common. Uh, ring neck snakes. They come out at night most of the time, so they're not seen, or people find them under rocks. Uh, red bellied snakes, another beautiful snake statewide, not reported that often also like to come out at night, but they show up in people's brush piles a lot. Smooth green snakes uh, love power lines, but also bald mountaintops. So um, they'll be found in, you know, the top of Blue Joe Mountain and Moose Mountains and um, the Ossipes and stuff like that, um, if the habitat's right, the blueberry barrens and stuff like that. Uh, milk snakes uh, also probably statewide, often confused with rattlesnakes because of the banding but they're totally harmless. They love to eat mice and other snakes. Um, so I just wanted to touch on sand pits real quick because abandoned sand and gravel pits are often overlooked or what, what people used to call scars on the landscape because they've been stripped, but they're really important habitat types because of the sandy xeric soils. So they, they host a whole bunch of different types of reptiles, amphibians, insects, pollinators, uh, and even mammals and birds. And so, um, this is an important habitat to, to protect um, and it's rare in the state and, and these, a lot of these animals just need it. So I talked about habitat management a little bit, but, um, and so a lot of the funding that, that I'm getting right now to, to do turtle work is going towards private land and doing, uh, creating that turtle nesting habitat. Um, and so willing landowners give us the, the chance to go onto their property and create nesting. And so in areas like this, where there's a stream all the way around this person's property, they did a hayfield buffer in the pink to protect wood turtles that are hanging around the edge. And then these blue areas were areas where they created nesting areas. They disturbed the soils or they brought in sand 
and turtles come up and they use it and turtles find it effectively. Um, and, and so uh, that's a big part of my work right now. And I'm working with uh, NRCS under USDA to do it. Um, so I keep saying report, report, report. Um, that's our reptile and amphibian reporting program. Um, just any reptile and amphibian is worth reporting. We wanna fill these maps, uh, these data gaps. American toads are everywhere. We gotta fill these gaps. Um, our website has all the species with pictures. Um, you, can, you can go in there and find it. These are the different ways to submit. So you can submit a hard copy form. You can get off our website um, and mail it, or you can email one to RARP at Wildlife. Uh, it's just a PDF. And then the, the New Hampshire Wildlife Sightings website, you can go on, sign up for an account, and you can tr uh, track all your sightings. This is it. Um, once you set up an account, and um, and then you get a map, and you can see all the species that you've reported, and it gives you the, the list there. Um, and then you can also report ver vernal pools on that same site, but you can do it through a, um, a form on our website as well. Um, I'm not going to go through our whole process for monitoring, but... Um, Last thing is just, uh, again, I mentioned uh, the non-game program is, is federally funded almost completely. And then moose plate money, we get a little bit from the New Hampshire General Fund, but we, and then the rest of it is donations. So we really rely on our federal partners, federal grants, uh, the moose plate money. So get that moose plate and then, and then donations and that's it. Okay, I'll take questions. Cool, thank you very much, Josh. That was really fascinating. Thank you. And I think if you wanted to email me some of the contact info slash reporting information for the reporting program, sure. then I can forward it along to everybody that was on the on the talk tonight. Um, so you did answer the question of where to report to. Um, there's only a couple of questions, so it won't take too long. Um, some folks were asking if you use Frog Watch data to create those maps. And um, there's also a specific question of why the marble salamanders are only prevalent in the southern part of the state. So if you want to touch on those quickly. Um, so uh, we, we do so we do have a, a reporting program for frogs uh, particularly so we have um, and um, I'll provide this link too but it's a uh, yeah it's fro frog call data so there's a we have a, a protocol for going out and with your smartphone or any recording device and just uh, taking two minutes of sound recordings um, if you happen to be in an area where there's leopard frogs or wood frogs or any of the species really, and we'll take that data and put it into our database. Um, so, uh, anyway, I'll provide that link. It has, it has the protocols in there, where to submit to, how to identify the calls. Um, and then what was the question about the, the marbled salamander? Uh, somebody was asking why they're only prevalent in the Southern parts of the state. I, yeah, that's, um, I think it has to do with the way that they, um, they breed. And so they're, um, as I mentioned, they're, they're, uh, they lay their eggs in the fall and then they wait for the vernal pools to fill up with water again when we get fall rains and then the eggs hatch um, and the larvae spend their time under the ice in the vernal pools. As you get farther north, that gets harder for those larvae larva to survive. And it also the winters come a little bit sooner so eggs kind of get frozen out before there's a, an influx of water. And so it's just really the, their behavior and, um, and temperature. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then one more, <clears throat> somebody uh, told a quick story and that kind of triggered a question for me. So someone mentioned that on Lake Ivanhoe on their beach a couple of years ago, they had a female turtle come up and lay eggs right on the beach in front of their lake house. And um, they hatched after about 90 days. Um, they said most of them headed for the lake. It looked, they said it felt like it might've been a hundred, probably wasn't that much, although maybe it was, you can maybe touch on that. But said most of them headed straight for the lake, but some of them got confused um, and were walking in all kinds of directions and then they redirected them. So I was kind of wondering, you know, if you witness, if you know that you have an egg site on your property or nearby, like to what degree is it appropriate to obviously you should rope it off, you know, how, how should you protect it? And then when the babies are born, do you interfere at all and try to redirect them towards the water? Or is that a, is that not a wise move? Um, from no, a that's, population a, standpoint? That's, a, that's a great question. Um, so um, typically turtles have um, 
they, they typically have positive geotaxis, which means they come out of it. They come out of the, uh, the nest chamber and they go downhill. They follow gravity. But some of them have a different strategy and they radiate in all different directions. And so snapping turtles will do that a lot. Um, and there's a reason for it. And so a lot of the ones that go directly down into the, into the lake, especially if it's a big lake, they get into the water and they swim out and life is good. And then a pickerel comes by and eats it. <laughs> they, get, they get predated very quickly in, in lakes and ponds. So a lot of them will radiate into different, different directions and they'll find a little low seep area or a vernal pool or even a little rut, a tire rut that's got water in it. And they can spend a little bit of time there feeding, growing a little bit mm. and then, you know, sort of getting their land legs and then, and then make their way into ponds and rivers or go somewhere else. And so it's definitely a strategy um, that I typically don't um, interfere with. You know, I, I just let them go where they're going to go unless I see them, you know, walking down a road, like right? get them off of the road. But, um, but yeah, I let them go where they're going to go. Um, so, cool. yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I didn't realize it was a survival strategy. It sounds like the strategy is to hang out while your brothers and sisters get gobbled up until the other guys are full and then you can scoot out into the water when you're, when you're in the clear. Yeah. <laughs> um, very interesting. And as, far well, as, as far as clutch sizes, um, you know, snapping turtles will probably have the most and they can, they can lay up to 20 eggs. Okay. That's about it. But in sandy areas, if somebody's got a lakefront, you know, beach or something, sometimes, you know, seven or eight snapping turtles can come up in the night and nest there and mm -hmm. you wouldn't even know it. And then, so all those turtles start hatching at once. It looks like it could be out of one clutch, but it's actually, you know, several turtles. Oh. Maybe the 100 wasn't an exaggeration. Yeah, no, maybe not. Cool. Um, well, that was really fascinating. That's all the, con um, I had a bunch of questions, obviously, but um, I can always ask them afterwards and I don't want to keep people too long past our one hour. That was all the questions that we got in the chat. So I think we'll uh, leave it there. And if you just uh, yeah, want to pass along any of that contact information and, and the forms to, to report, that to me, I can pass it on to everybody that was here this evening. Sure. And would you like a PDF of the um, presentation? Um, yeah, that'd be help. That'd be great as well, actually. Okay. Yep. I'll send you all that information. And um, thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it. Cool. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Thanks a lot. And thanks everybody for attending this evening. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody.